um, is by Andrea. Uh, I will not pronounce her last name because I, it would probably be my Dutch pronunciation that she might not agree with. I have the same thing with Matt, who doesn't agree with the way I pronounce his last name, even though it's obviously <laughs> meant to be Dutch. Um, and Andrea will talk about setting up a data site consortium in New Zealand. So over to you, Andrea. All right, thank you. How is this volume? That's good, thank you. Okay, and do you see a, a full PowerPoint slide? Yes, we do, yes. Okay, okay great. So uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Um, my presentation is about setting up a consortium in New Zealand. And the target for this um, presentation is mainly organizations that are considering setting up and leading a data site consortium. So I hope there's some of you listening to me. The National Library of New Zealand is the consortium lead for our data site consortium in New Zealand. We formed the consortium almost two years ago. And at the time, I felt like we were kind of making it all up. Um, we went along without a lot of examples that we could find from others um, at the time. So this presentation focuses on some of the decisions we made along the way, um, some of our current challenges, and some of the lessons we learned. For context, I wanted to give you an, a brief overview of what the research community looks like in New Zealand. These are some of the key organizations conducting research and so producing research data. We have seven Crown Research Institutes, or CRIs. These are science research businesses owned by the New Zealand government. Just over 4,000 staff are employed in the CRIs, and they do research in areas like the nat 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 sorry, natural resources and climate. We have eight universities that are all research-based institutions spread across New Zealand. We have 10 centers of research excellence or cores. These are university-hosted inter-institutional research networks that enable scientists from the CRIs, universities, and other research organizations to work together on strategic focused areas, for example, brain research or earthquake resilience. We also have independent or non-government owned research organizations, private businesses, and government agencies that conduct research. Before the New Zealand Consortium was in place, we had three, three organizations in New Zealand that were acquiring DRIs through the California Digital Library's EasyID service. Um, as you probably know, the EasyID Easy service model was changed to focus on the University of California, so we needed a new solution. As a result, in 2017 and 18, we started exploring different options for developing a New Zealand consortium. We needed to fill the DOI registration gap that had been filled by EasyID, but we also were seeking a consortium solution for additional benefit, shown on the slide there. We wanted a forum for sharing best practice and tools that support DOI workflows. We wanted to be able to encourage adoption and appropriate use of DOIs. Um, but more generally, we wanted to promote open data and sharing of research outputs. In 2017, the Council of New Zealand University Libraries, or CONSUL, commissioned a consulting firm to look at our options for forming a DOI consortium in New Zealand. This firm concluded that there was an appetite for a consor consortium in New Zealand um, among ab about 20 to 30 New Zealand organizations. So this has been the, the target as far as the number of organizations that we're shooting for in our consortium. This report looked at various options for the consortium in terms of staffing and recommended dedicating 1.5 FTE to support the consortium and predicted an annual cost of 20,000 New Zealand dollars. The National Library was brought into the con conversation as a potential lead for the consortium. And because we didn't have a lot of extra resources to dedicate to this, we started exploring alternative structures for the consortium that would use less resources and would therefore cost less. The National Library seemed to be a good fit as the consortium lead. There is already precedent for the library to provide nationwide services, particularly to libraries and schools across New Zealand. Tapuna Services was the first um, in the world national resource sharing system 
providing New Zealand libraries with access to international collections and databases and cataloging resources, such as Maori subject headings. Through its EPIC consortium, the library provides access to e-resources and negotiates group licenses on behalf of libraries and schools. For public libraries, the library provides free access to the internet and computing equipment and a shared library system for collection management. For schools, the library provides lending service, support for school libraries, teaching and learning resources, programs to promote and support reading, and real-time help from resource librarians, sorry, reference librarians. The library's Digital New Zealand provides online and API access to digital resources from hundreds of New Zealand organizations. And the library serves as the central coordinator for various identifiers, ISBNs, ISSNs, ISMNs, for publishers publishing in New Zealand. We also heard from New Zealand organizations that because of the library's focus on preservation and long-term accessibility, we would be in a position to provide guidance on DOIs because of the persistent access they enable provided they're managed properly. The first thing we did to set up the consortium was to get a group of organizations together in the same room to review a draft terms of reference I put together for the consortium. It proved to be a good way to find out where we had consensus and where we didn't before anything was in place. These are some of the main sections of our terms of reference. The background has basic information about the consortium, why it was created, the relationship to data site and the benefits that we see. The purpose outlined two roles for our consortium. One is a strategic role, providing pathways for advice and guidance on the direction and activities related to DRI usage in New Zealand and globally, but also an operational role, facilitating the creation, management, and use of DOIs within the consortium members' organizations. The structure is shown here. There is a coordinating committee to approve processes and change the terms of reference. The responsibilities of member organizations is to manage their institution's DOIs, communicate with their institution's scholars about DOIs, and develop their institution's policies around DOIs. The secretariat or consortium lead, which is the library, has responsibility to be the primary liaison to data site, to handle all the invoices, to schedule meetings when needed, and to be the first contact for new members. We designed for an interest group also to be a community of practice open to any interested individuals. It was designed in advance to accommodate growth within the New Zealand DOI consortium. The membership section describes the eligibility requirements and responsibilities, which are very light. Um, basically, the members need to sign an agreement, agree to pay the annual fees, and join the interest group. One of the questions we discussed was around the structure of the consortium. It was pr pretty clear from the beginning of our discussions that our members wanted to have as lightweight a structure as possible. Everyone involved had a lot of other responsibilities and wanted to minimize the time and effort required. We wondered if it was overkill to have an interest group in addition to the coordinating committee. We decided to go ahead and create an interest group because it was a way to include individuals and organizations who have a vested interest in open data and research, research sharing, but aren't necessarily minting DOIs. We talked to DataSite about the logistics of adding members mid-year, and that seems straightforward, so our members are happy to allow that. We also discussed ongoing communication and support. We initially set up a forum in Lumio, but ended up migrating it to a Google group. The question of how to provide additional support for our member institutions came up, but has not yet been fully addressed, other than to note that there's still a need for it. Over the last year or so, um, as you know, there were a couple of changes introduced by DataSite, a new member model that better supports consortia, and more recently, a change to the funding model that will take effect next year. In both cases, as the consortium lead, the library had the task of first learning about the changes and then communicating them to our members. Data site staff helped with this by educating us about the changes and preparing informational material, but it did take some time and effort to help our members understand the changes. 
To promote the consortium and help with member onboarding, the library has created minimal outreach material. We have a public web page on our website that lists the current consortium members, explains how to become a member and who to contact. We've created some communication templates for potential new members with introductory material about the consortium, the consortium agreement, and the process for becoming a member. We definitely need more of this. Most of our outreach currently is in response to queries. Someone hears about it and wants to know more. One of my goals for the next few months is to create outreach material that doesn't assume someone already knows the value and purpose of DOIs. I'd like to have this outreach material to send out to all prospective organizations for our consortium or to leave at conferences. And lastly, I've created some slides to use in presentations about the consortium. I've tried to create slides that show the value of joining the consortium. For example, a table that shows how much a member saves by joining through our data site consortium versus as a direct member. Here's another example of something I've used in presentations to talk about the financial advantage of the consortium. This was based on the previous billing model though. It shows that as the number of members in our consortium increases, the fees for each consortium member will go down slightly because there are more member organizations to split the costs. This is also incentive for our member organizations to help bring new members on. I'll have to find another way to communicate this with the new billing model um, because in the new billing model, it, the, your cost will vary depending on the number of DOIs minted. But for most of our members, the cost for each is a lot less with the new model. I'd be very interested to hear from others how they demonstrate the value of joining a data site consortium. I mentioned earlier the library's consortium lead role being based on the library as a service provider and to pro provide leadership on preservation and long-term accessibility. Some for the library within our consortium. One potential role is as a member of the consortium. The National Library of New Zealand, like other similar institutions around the world, is adapting to support emerging forms of research, such as the digital humanities and other forms of research. Also, we have open data sets available to researchers, downloadable from our website, or available on demand by researchers. Some of this data is collection items that have been packaged up for analysis. Other data sets are derivative or are metadata data sets. It, it may be that we decide to provide DOIs for them to facilitate discovery in citations. Following on from that, there could be a role for us to encourage more GLAM institutions to use DOIs for their open data sets. Especially in the last few years, there have been growing interest and activity within GLAM institutions to provide their collections or derivatives as data for researchers to consume. Some of this data is available for download, but DOIs or other types of PIDs are not necessarily provided yet. So I mentioned this as a potential growth area for DOI advocacy and adoption. In summary, based on our experience in New Zealand setting up a data site consortium, here are th some of the things that we've learned. I don't know if it is common with the other data site consortia, but we found that drafting a terms of reference for ourselves was a very good way to discuss how the consortium will work. Having the founding organizations discuss it got us to a fairly quick agreement on the logistics. Finding the right amount of structure for your consortium is an art form. In the exploratory report on a New Zealand consortium I mentioned earlier, it had recommended more FTE and, a and as a result of a higher cost than we ended up going with. There's some advantages to keeping it light, but we're still light in some areas, such as outreach, advocacy, and education that we need to figure out. We found that DataSite will provide the consortium leads with the help needed to get us through any changes but we do need to recognize that they will take some of our effort and time so to plan for that if possible. Lastly, even if you're in the consortium setup phase, it's never too soon to plan for growing your consortium. Some steps to consider are identifying all the key organizations that are likely to need DOI services and to identify other organizations and networks that can assist with the outreach. In our consortium, one of our members is particularly good at outreach. So my plan is to see if I can supply that member with outreach material to help me out. Thank you, and I look forward to talking with you during the, out, during the breakout sessions. Thank you, Andrea. I think that provided a really great overview. Um, 
And I briefly wanted to uh, comment on your point about communicating the value of joining a consortium, because actually that is something that we've been discussing with some of the other consortium leads as well. So there's clearly a need. And yeah, we'd be very happy to work with you and some of the others on developing some materials so that that becomes easier for consortium leads, because we do think that that is very important. Okay, that would be great. Okay, so the next talk is by Estelle. So Estelle, if you want, you can try to share your screen. Yes. Um, and Estelle will talk about connecting persistent identifiers. Can you see my screen now? Yes, but it's not full screen yet. Yeah, it's full screen now. Is yeah. it? Yeah, okay. it is. Thank Great. you. Okay. Yeah, so thank you everyone. I'm Chechi Estelgen. I'm the ORCID APEC engagement manager. So today I'm actually very happy to presenting some of the ideas about connect piece together in open research infrastructure. So the, my presentation today will cover different dimensions. So I will start by introducing a bit about the value of, the value of identifiers in terms of interoperability in research infrastructure. Probably you, some of you or most of us know that, but I still want to highlight a little bit and introduce a bit about the ORCID community. And specifically last, I'm going to share a bit more on the use cases between ORCID data science in terms of auto update. So, but I would like really to begin by stating ORCID's vision is really a world where all who participate in research, scholarship, and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions and affiliations across time, disciplines, and borders. And to do that, so identifiers actually enable uh, research infrastructure to be more at a global scale. So the value of identifiers, so pits for people like for ORCID ID and uh, for places like research organization registry and for things like DOI are really fundamental elements in anchoring and referencing information in a trusted and interoperable way. So this is a different example showing different identifiers for people, places, and things. And I want to highlight that the importance is to uh, bring those pits together to make them interoperable, interoperable with each other and to connect them together. In that way, it can really man manifest the value of you know, pits collaborations. And what is ORCID? So, um, okay, it's a global, unique, and open identifier for researchers. And the researchers share their ID with organizations during research workflows. And it's a place to store and share those different connections between IDs and research activities or affiliations. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to show some uh, examples of different connections made by ORCID members to ORCID. So this is an example actually from New Zealand, our consortial lead in New Zealand Royal Society. So it connects the researchers uh, employment information back to ORCID registry. And this is another example of funding information. Uh, this is the member in Taiwan Chang'e University. It connects um, the researchers funding information to the researchers records. And it's an uh, example in from Japan. So this is actually from the research name Resolve ID from Japan. And this is an example from Works. And it's uh, actually the example is from Yonsei University Medical Library in Korea. So it connects work information to the researchers' ORCID records. And uh, this is an example of professional profile. So you can connect actually quite a lot of different information from your platform to OK registry. And they connect their professional profile, e-scientist uh, to OK, reg OK registry. This is the example from uh, agricultural, Chinese Agricultural Science Information Institute in China. And here is a diagram that just briefly touch base that the value of an ORCID ID, and of course, uh, ORCID is a community-driven um, organization. So we work with different uh, identifier 
providers like DataSite and different organizations. So this diagram illustrates interoperability. So it all starts from researchers having OKI IP first, and those different roles in the research workflow, like publishing organizations or employers, like research institutes or funding organizations, they can all together use uh, the mechanism of ORCID to connect information, they validated information from their site to be circulated uh, later on. And also they can collect information pushed by different organizations to their system for their use. So for instance, a publisher can collect, sorry, can connect publication information. And in that sense, the research institutes can collect those publication information back to enhance their platform. And also the funder can collect uh, publication information as well. And then those information can circulate it around. Uh, this uh, attributes to the community effort by adopting PID together. So yeah, so ORCID is really a community uh, driven organization, just like data side. And this is the ORCID team. And this is ORCID APAC engagement team. So my colleague Camille also joined us today and we also had another co colleague Brian in Hong Kong. And ORC is a non-profit membership and platform driven organization, a platform neutral organization. And we are assisted by members and we are governed by representatives from a board. So now we have more than 9 million researchers registered in OK ID and we have 1,000 more than 1,000 member organizations around 50 one countries, including also 22 national consortia. And now we got more than 600 research systems using ORCID. So more specifically, ORCID and APAC. So in APAC, uh, Asia and Oceania together, we got 145 members now. And we got 132 integrations. Those uh, members use uh, our API to connect their system with ORCID. Uh, we got four national consortia in Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Taiwan. And uh, in particular, I want to stress that uh, we also work closely with three DOIRs here in Asia. That's everything in Taiwan and Japan Lake Center, and also KIST in Korea. Yeah, in the next few slides, I'm going to share a bit more specifically on the use cases of auto update. But uh, let's begin by data repositories. So I think uh, in terms of data side or in terms of data management, so data repository are really one of the key components. So back in 2018, Loki had formed a task force that uh, they uh, drafted some recommendations. And at present, Loki work with them closely to advocate adoption of PITs, both DOIs or uh, ORCID in their repository platforms. Some examples of repositories supporting ORCID include Dryad Fixture through DataSite and DSpace. So here comes the use case of auto updates or automatic updates. So what does it really mean? It means uh, it, the, uh, the process can automatically push metadata to ORCID when an ORCID identifier is found in routing in newly registered DOI names. So it enables time savings for researchers and it preserves metadata quality and it supports transparency and trust in research information. And this really manifests the value of connect piece together. So in this scenario is ORCID ID and uh, DOI. And uh, at present, so there are three DOIs, uh, three DOIs yet support this. Although they may be slightly different, they may uh, slightly differ in a way they support it. But in general, three DOIRs, three DOIRs support this. It's CrossRef data set in Japan Lake Center. And this is the screenshot. Uh, it's actually from my ORCID records. So I got something uh, published in Fixture and it is uh, automatically updated to my ORCID records through data set. So how does this happen? So it's um, all this begins with uh, researchers connect their ORCID ID to dataset profile, enabling auto-update feature. And data setters 
or data warehouse that embeds OKID IDs in data set metadata. And um, in particular, we encourage that those uh, OKID IDs should shall be really shared by researchers themselves instead of manually typed. And then data sites will discover that in the metadata that is going to be deposited for GOIs, there will be authenticated ORCID IDs. And then um, they will check those when assigning GOIs to new works. And at ORCID, we receive this to data, uh, from data site and then update those information back to resource or researchers ORCID records. Yeah, and uh, in the last, I want to uh, stress importance that each of us really want to have a better region or we want to have a more transparent, automated way of information sharing, have better quality uh, of have more, have better metadata quality. But this actually um, relies on each part of the community must participate together to build the infrastru infrastructure that enable the research data to be processed, archived, interpreted, and published in a more valuable way and more transparent way. And last, <laughs> this is kind of the um, announcement. So probably some of you know it, but the, probably a few you haven't known this. So uh, every year there will be an uh, event that dedicate to PITS. It's a PITS festival. <laughs> and this year, no, next year in 2021, it will be online due to COVID. And the date is uh, 27th January. I think they, we haven't really opened for registration, but it will be open soon. But now it's open uh, for, to call for session submission. So you are welcome to submit the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stel, and thanks for mentioning Pitapalooza. It's uh, really good to uh, tell people that they can now uh, submit their ideas and that it will take place, um, well, basically around the clock so that it's um, now available and open to all different time zones in the world. So thanks yeah. for that. It's 24 hours, so we don't yeah. need we don't need to really get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> no one needs to get up at 4 or 5 a.m. Everyone can dial in at a convenient time and uh, participate in the sessions that they're interested in. Um, all right, so then the last talk is by someone who did have to get up at 4 a.m. Um, so yeah, sorry, Scott. No, Scott expected to be in Hong Kong, but ended up being in the UK. So Dan, it was suddenly very early for him. <laughs> yeah, I should have been back in Hong Kong, but I'm actually in dark and gloomy Scotland at the moment. So apologies if I'm not the most sharp, but anyway, I'll try my best. Thank you. Feel free to share your screen. Share screen. Okay, does this work? And then if I put it full screen. Is this working? Yeah, that all works. Thank you. Great. Okay. So um, I've been tasked to uh, talk about metadata today. Um, my background originally was as a, a bench scientist. And so it's my natural inclination to um, pick at things and, and, tr and kind of test hypotheses. And um, so this is uh, something that we've done, um, particularly on 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 metadata and um, trying to measure the benefits of of richer metadata. Um, a quick introduction on myself and um, what we've been doing at GigaScience. So we're effectively a, a, a data publisher. We launched um, eight years ago. It was our um, birthday a, a few months ago, and we kind of gathered a bit of data to summarize what we've done because. We essentially incentivize um, people sharing their data um, with sort of data description articles. And then we tie this in with our with a repository, GigaDB, um, where we've been working with data sites since um, 2011 to um, you know, uh, give uh, data DOIs to the, to the supporting data underlying these papers. Um, in eight years, we've published uh, 765 papers, 231 of these specifically for these um, 
data papers. Um, and uh, this has been tied into about 46 terabytes of data that we've been hosting in our repository. Nearly 2,000 um, data sets, uh, data DOIs minted alongside, we've also been using data set DOIs to make the peer reviews open, for example. Um, so in this um, nearly a decade of experience, you know, we started working with Datasite in 2011 and uh, back in 2012, um, I uh, was invited to speak at the summer meeting uh, in Copenhagen and um, this talk, which is available on YouTube um, and the Datasite YouTube channel, um, I, I, I took a, a similar approach to, to data citation um, and our experiences um, doing this, kind of really picking apart how it's working, what the state of play was in, uh, in 2012. Um, and um, to, to summarize the, the video so you don't necessarily have to, to um, watch it, at, in 2012, um, we we and a few others had just managed to show that there was a kind of potential uh, user base. Uh, journals were just starting to accept this, and we just managed to force a few data citations into the references of journals. But this at, at this point, it was still too early to track it to for any of this to be collected by the citation indexes, and so obviously there was no metrics. So there was no ability to kind of use this data. very hard to get people to to actually cite data to to to, to you know there's been campaigns from gbif and others hashtag cite the doi and um but but in theory this should all be working a lot better now but um when you kind of uh, look under the hood um unfortunately there are still technical problems the journals are now citing the stuff correctly uh, in theory, they should be sending it to Crossref, um, but in practice, there are problems with the third-party vendors that the that all of the the um, journals, all of the publishers work with, and so ninety percent of uh, probably more than ninety percent of these DOIs are just not ending up in Crossref metadata, not uh, and therefore the citations are not showing up in event data. So the the this is an example of you know there are there are people take assumptions that these things are working but when you really dig into it and test this um you realize there are still a lot of a lot of problems and our and our kind of um presumptions are not necessarily correct so this is part you know inspired by this this is part of the reason that we really wanted to kind of look at metadata uh, Structuring this this short presentation in a similar way to my previous one, um, you know, asking a question: Where is metadata in 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 twenty twenty? Um, the in, in the sort of open data community, there's been a, a movement from just having data sets available, um, you know, um, and and open to to fair data. So more. Um, efforts to to add sort of metadata for re reusability um, and data journals such as ourselves are helping incentivize this you know this this best practice scrutinizing that with peer review and giving people rewards for for doing that um, in recent years uh, the, you know the fact that the Google data set search has come on the scene has pushed um, a lot of the data repositories to um, use schema.org metadata, um, you know, structure their metadata to really boost the, the um, discoverability in, in Google. And um, we're in a lucky position now that, you know, we do have event data and, and um, uh, schemes such as Scholix and the like um, that have produced excellent new resources of non-proprietary open usable citation data. Um, linking Crossref and DOI, for example. And the fact that we have these uh, open data sources now allows fantastic potential for, for you know, new, new indexes and search, um, uh, knowledge graphs, things like data site commons and, and other tools that we can now build upon these richer data sources. So in theory, we're in a good place, 
um, in terms of the in terms of the infrastructure. We just got to get people to use this stuff. And there are schemes like uh, Metadata 2020 that have been, you know, promoting this best practice, promoting people to 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 do this, and and they they want to share stories. So, um, you know. Uh, anecdotal qualitative stories that are very useful to drive people but and and and, and at, at giga science we we put in a lot of work to to do this stuff to 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 add value we have a team of three curators we pay them a load of money to basically push things to 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 to, to enrich in the, the, the metadata so going beyond the minimal uh, data site metadata terms you know basic stuff like title it's a data set names and a few things like that you know we really push to get in all of that the orchid ids if they have them we have keywords both user defined ones and our own um sub kind of uh subject specific uh you know funding ids um licensing some descriptions and any relationship info with you know other identifiers is it related to software or other other versions? And then beyond this to the kind of fair data, um, data set specific things based on various reporting checklists, um, you know, ontologies, um, location, specimen, phenotypic information and, and other identifiers. So this is a lot, this is a lot of work, right? And um, it, everybody, it, to make metadata richer, we're expending a lot of effort and cost on this but as you know as a scientist uh, i then always ask the question is it worth the effort though like we need evidence we need kind of quant like quantitative data showing this and we, we can't just take assumptions and, and using the kind of carrot analogy you know we're doing this as a kind of carrot to encourage people but do people actually want to know want to eat carrots right it, like actually providing some evidence on the nutritional information is make helps make our case that people need to eat these carrots and so this inspired us to try to to um yeah figure out how we can get some some nice quantitative data and the the obvious approach was to to follow what what the medical community does um set you know the the best evidence in the kind of pyramid pyramid of evidence is, is a really randomized control trials and but this isn't just for medical studies. You can do an RCT on effectively anything. So I was trying to do this for, um, for metadata and looking for um, a, a potential case study for this. This kind of, this project fell on our lap where we had to <coughs> mint a thou effectively a thousand DOIs. Um, this, uh, I won't go into too much details on the, the techie science of this, but it was a study where they digitized an entire botanical garden. It was basically a proof of concept scaling up to show that you could do 10,000 genomes. They sort of did a thousand and it showed that you could scale up species, species identification. People could actually use this data. And we published the first phase of this. And in terms of the sample size, we thought, okay, this is a nice example that we could use for an RCT. We, could, we can split this into two different groups. Um, we, we had, a, so the, in terms of the practical side, the, the paper had one overarching DOI that comes with a link to everything because you couldn't cite a thousand DOIs in one paper, for example. But under this, we then were issuing individual DOIs to all of the, all of the specimens, all of the, the a thousand potentially species. And um, there was sequencing data and there was imaging data. Um, all of this was used for species identification. So it was an ongoing process. Some of the species uh, were more, more processed. We had kind of richer, um, uh, richer data for them. Um, some of them hadn't been properly identified. So we wanted to update these later. Um, and the, the rich, so, you know, we, at minimum, we always would have to put the uh, basic data site metadata, but then we wanted to also add in all of this richer metadata um, stuff for, for discoverability. Again, these this authorship and orchid, orchid details, and then the kind of contextual fair um, reusability uh, metadata. So um, 
we we use this to, to set up an experiment then and and do one of these randomized controlled trials. So we use the um, uh, OSF pre-registration tool to basically set this experiment up and pre-register what we were doing before we did it. So we couldn't move the goalposts later on. This is this is good practice. This is the basic thing that you need to do with a with an with an RCT with a randomized controlled trial like this. So. It, it was a, a relatively simple experiment. Um, you know, we've got about a thousand data sets. So, so we wanted to balance the ones with the higher data content and the lower data content. So we, we separate these and, and then basically did a, a simple randomization ran between in, in, in Excel and then just made two, two sets. So half, we then gave uh, rich data sites, metadata, uh, you know, our, our richer standard metadata set. And then the other half, we just gave basic, the, 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 the minimal data site metadata. And then what you do is you just wait. Um, so uh, we started this in the beginning of 2019 and then basically left it until early 2020, um, the year of metadata. Um, and, and so, yeah, we just sat on it, didn't really want to touch it. And then after 12 months, we then, uh, can look at to see, is there any difference in, in, in the, in the metrics? We had scripts to look at visits, downloads, and potentially if there were citations. And so the results of this, we've only finally sort of dug into this a bit, but the results, drum roll, it didn't work. Um, which was kind of unfortunate, but um, looking at this, I, I think this was an, it, it, it was a proof of concept, but it was basically an underpowered um, experiment. And we were very focused on sample size, um, but not so much on the, the usability, the accessibility of this data. The number of page views for all of these data sets was only about 500 for, for everything, like very, very low, much lower than, our, than the kind of average um, accesses for our other data sets. Um, trying to match this with equivalent um, individual genomes for, for um, uh, similar projects on birds or, or orphan crops. Um, these had about 10 times more uh, uh, views that, um, and, and you know we're not getting citations and and uh, the because the views are so low um, and the difference between the rich and poor metadata um, in these actually there was even slightly less hits on the rich metadata than on the poor but this was basically just noise this was just because it was underpowered and we were getting very very few hits on this so I think this was a useful kind of um, example, less, you know, for lessons learned. Um, but the problem was the the actual um, study, if, because they were unidentified species, people are not looking for them. It's not a great use case for discoverability. Um, if we had a, a, an example that was much more popular, then you would actually see, hopefully, see something useful here. This kind of quick and dirty approach unfortunately didn't work. And yeah, we need. To do this properly, you need a wider spectrum of more popular data sets and probably a bigger sample size. Um, if you wanted to um, just do this um, uh, over, you know, historical data sets or, or randomized small clusters, you need to you, you need to match the comparison groups very well. Um, this makes things tricky. You you ideally want a big batch of data sets released at the same time or do them in small batches to make, because you get um, access differences over the calendar year, you know, usage spikes. These are all of the things for, uh, for this type of study that you need to take into account. It would be better to test it in, if for with, like other data producers, other databases with higher accesses and turnover. That would work better. And, um, and then, yeah, then uh, you could just ra um, randomly assign them into these two groups. And this kind of approach would probably work better with crossref uh, metadata. Uh, RCTs on crossref would probably work better than data site ones. There's more users, more people using kind of downstream tools and and uh, discovering things through that at the moment. You know, data site is catching up on this, but at the you know crossref 
a crossref RCT, uh, we think would work a lot better. Um, so to, you know, to really summarize, um, we would encourage people to, um, to do these kinds of metadata experiments. It didn't work in our case, but that, um, <laughs> that only makes us uh, keener to, to, to push others to do these kinds of things, to quantify the, the quantify and really, um, you know, we can tell our, the, the people we work with, we, we can quantify and show them that rich metadata is important. Um, and I hope that this, um, this talk and this approach also uh, will just promote discussion in the, uh, in the breakout that is coming shortly. So I hope I was to time and um, yeah, just thank um, people who support us, uh, BGI. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for data sites for, for nine years of um, this great infrastructure. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of done. Thanks a lot, Scott. I think that was really interesting.